Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101 and our lecture on IP management. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I've just got a couple announcements to make. Um, you might have noticed outside that we have a bunch of the um, Canadian Intellectual Property Law for Dummies books. Um, we're selling them for the cost that we paid for. Um, we obviously weren't able to get one for everybody. It's a pretty big audience, and it's given it's a free course. But if you're interested, it's a, it's a quick read and an easy read on what can be a complicated subject. I also wanted to remind people who are interested in the Upstart competition that it's about, the deadline is February 3rd. It's about three week, or two weeks away. Um, to apply, you have to submit a three-page executive summary. So if you're interested in applying, go to www.marsd.com slash upstart or ask uh, one of us um, for that email uh, website address. Um, so tonight we have one of, our, um, one of our speakers that has been with the program since the very beginning. Uh, Arsha Tabritzi remembers when Entrepreneurship 101 was created by Tony Redpath and Cynthia Goh in the chemistry department at U of T, which was about seven or eight years ago. So they started this program with about 12 grads um, in chemistry and physics. So it's, gone, it's come a long way, and we're, we're really happy that he's continued with the program and continues year upon year to bring his knowledge. Um, he, he has quite an, a unique background. He started with as a former software engineer at IBM before working as a technology transactions attorney at the renowned Silicon Valley firm uh, Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati. He started his own boutique technology law firm, uh, the Tabritzi Law Office PC, in 2002. And there he works with um, primarily IT and clean tech startups, um, as well as uh, larger technology companies and angel investors and VCs, and he provides practical and strategic advice to them. And just a note, uh, he told me that his son might be watching on the webcast. So Aiden, if you're out there, we hope you enjoy your father's lecture. Welcome, Arsha. <clears throat> okay, everyone can hear me okay? Thank you, Carrie, for that introduction. Hi, Aiden, how are you? I had to do that. Um, okay, so Carrie uh, already told you a bit about my background. Um, <clears throat> so I was at the U of T Computer Engineering. I worked uh, for a year at IBM in the software lab in, in Toronto. And then as some of my friends like to remind me, I joined the dark side and went to U of T Law School. Uh, but then as I try and remind them is, you know, I, I kind of came back to the force. You know, even my thesis in law school was on university spinoffs, right? That's not what you'd expect a law school thesis to be on. And I've always continued working essentially with uh, technology startups from uh, Wilson Sansini, which Kerry mentioned, uh, which is kind of a you know, brand firm in the valley. They incorporated Google, they IPO'd Apple, a uh, very large well-known tech firm, and then came back and went very small. Uh, so we have a boutique firm and we basically do full service uh, startup law and uh, anything from uh, incorporation financing uh, IP strategy, trademarks, licensing, web issues. And we really, with our startup clients, and by startup I mean you know, you're just starting out, you have a concept or a prototype, we really look at, uh, look at it as a long-term partnership. And so um, you know, we, we will do alternative fee arrangements with our clients. Um, and you know, we typically will take three to four startups each year. That's really kind of the, the bandwidth that we have. So we really look at it as a strategic partnership. Just uh, some of our clients that we've acted, at, uh, acted for in the past, and as Carrie said, primarily IT, web-based, although we've done stuff in clean tech and, and nano and materials and things like that as well. So, why are we here? Okay, so we're not here to become IP lawyers. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that just to be funny, but really your, your job is to build your companies. Um, I'm also not here to teach you how to file or draft a patent. I think you should hire a qualified patent agent to do that, um, although you should learn about it, but you, know, you shouldn't spend your time uh, on that stuff. Neither am I here to teach you how to file a trademark. You should hire a qualified trademark agent to do that. And when I say your job is to build companies, I actually read on a blog uh, about a week ago that you know, the, the value of, if you try and value the time of a startup founder, you could value it at, at about $1,000 an hour. Now, I don't know how accurate that is, but I think the point there is that 
you as the startup founder have a lot of things to be, worry about, and I, I don't know if necessarily you're gonna be worrying about all these legal things. But um, we're gonna cover some of these issues. And finally, you're not here to learn how to file a copyright, and the point I'll make there, though, is that it's actually very simple to file copyright, and if you go to the copyright office uh, in Canada, you can basically see how simple it is, and that one, probably, you don't even need a lawyer to do it. Okay. So why are we really here, now that I've told you why we're not here? Why we are, why, why, the reasons why I don't think, uh, anyway, I don't know what I'm saying. Okay, why are we really here? To learn three things. So the first thing I wanna cover is what is the big deal with IP? Um, second, I'm gonna tell you why you should care about IP. And third, I'm gonna tell you what do you do about IP. So those are really the three things we're gonna focus on today. So what is the big deal with IP? Well, I think the real thing there is that there's really billions of dollars at stake, right? I mean, you look at some of the recent headlines the past few years, you know, Google spending, you know, over $12 billion acquiring uh, Motorola Mobility. You look at Apple and how uh, aggressive they've been in terms of, um, you know, bulking up and enforcing their patents against uh, Android. And when I say Android, I don't mean necessarily the Android operating system or the owner of Android, Google, but against you know, device manufacturers such as Samsung, for example, right, who relies on the Android uh, operating system. Uh, you look at it in terms of the auction for the Nortel patents and you know, the billions of dollars, again, that were spent there, you know, and companies coming together in consortiums to buy out these patents. Um, I don't know here, has anybody heard of the I4I case? No? No one? Okay, a few people. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a massive uh, win, both for the company and also for the venture investors in that company, and they won a $240 million um, infringement award against Microsoft. Um, now you look at it from a trademark perspective, and again, the recent news, I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, BlackBerry had lost, or RIM lost, the ability to use BBX uh, as their brand, and now they're actually caught up in another lawsuit uh, in Canada with a, a non-profit entity over uh, their use of BBM, and they might even lose that. Um, another thing I'm sure most of you guys have seen the social network, and you know, IP matters, because as you saw, you know, the Winklevoss twins uh, you know, followed through with their lawsuit, and I think, I don't know what the final award was, I think it was 30 or 40 million dollars. So there's, you know, IP matters. It also matters because I read about it in the Steve Jobs biography. Has anybody read the Steve Jobs bio? Yeah. Nobody, really? Oh, okay, two or three people? Wow, I thought there'd be more. Anyway, I read it over the Christmas break and um, you know, a few things stood out. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs has dozens of patents uh, in his name. So uh, I think that alone should tell you that, that IP matters. Um, if you read the book or if you know about the history of uh, Apple and Windows, you may know that uh, Apple uh, did uh, pursue a copyright infringement case against the Windows operating system. Uh, and they ultimately did lose that case. Um, that may have something to do with uh, Steve Jobs focusing uh, more aggressively on obtaining patents as a form of IP protection. And we'll talk a little bit more about differences between patents and, and copyright. Uh, but the interesting side note there is that some of you may or may not know, but Apple, in fact, got its graphical user interface or the notion idea for Windows from the Xerox PARC, uh, which is the Palo Alto Research Center. So, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, taking a little bit from here, taking a little bit from there. But for your purposes, you want to make sure that that doesn't happen to you or your IP. Um, if you read the book, you also know that IP came into play uh, in basically one of the most successful um, new product or services that uh, Steve Jobs came up with after his return to Apple, which is iTunes. And really, iTunes um, is, was all about his ability to negotiate the rights uh, with the recording industry uh, and the record labels uh, to you know, music catalogs, right? And there was a lot of people, I mean, and if you read the book, you'll see, who doubted that he could actually pull that off. So again, IP was central uh, to the success of, of uh, the iTunes venture. Um, the other thing that's interesting um, and that I've discussed with a few people and people are of different minds on this, but I don't know if uh, anybody here knows about sort of you know, the lean startup methodology in, in digital media and technology. And 
really the lean startup methodology are one of the basic premises, uh, fundamental premises of that is you know you launch early, you open it up, and you basically get user feedback and you iterate, iterate, iterate. If you uh, know about Steve Jobs and if you've read the book, you know Steve Jobs was, I mean, essentially the antithesis of the lean startup methodology in the sense that he was extremely secretive. <laughs> he was very careful about not disclosing his ideas, uh, very carefully planning uh, his product launch, and really, you know, as I'm sure all of you know, not really putting too much credence into market research. So he's not about early user feedback. He was all about, I will tell you what you need. Uh, I don't need to get your feedback. So IP matters, again, because I read about it in the Steve Jobs biography. Now, let's get a bit more serious. So what, really, why, why should you care about IP? Well, I think fundamentally there's three reasons why you should care about IP. And this comes down to three fundamental attributes of IP as a category. Um, one is that IP is a legal fortress. Okay? So it's a fortress, but it's a fortress afforded to you by legal principles. And what it does is it gives you uh, the ability to protect your valuable assets. So that's the first point. IP is a legal fortress. Two, IP is a sword and a shield. So IP gives you a tool to attack your competitors, but it also gives you a tool to defend against your competitors. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, IP is a money-making tool. So it's not only about filing paperwork, but it actually ties directly into your business model and revenue generation for your company. So IP helps you monetize your business assets. So let's get a little bit more into the details about uh, these various points. So first one, IP is a legal fortress. So IP provides you essentially with an ability to collect your assets. And what I mean, I'm talking about your intangible assets, not your buildings or you know, hard property and equipment, um, but things such as what's sitting in the minds of your employees or the ideas and the concepts and the work product that your employees create. So through employment agreements, for example, uh, you can uh, centralize and collect the intangible assets that may reside in your employees' minds or that they might create, including, for example, patents or patentable subject matter. Same thing applies to consulting agreements where you're dealing with arm's length contractors. So a lot of you, uh, if you're just starting up, most likely you're not going to be hiring employees for your startups because you won't have the money and you don't want to have the overhead, so you're going to hire people on a consulting or independent contractor basis. And in those agreements as well, you want to make sure that the IP or the assets that these uh, consultants develop for you are collected and centralized in your, in your enterprise. So IP is a legal for it helps you collect your assets, but it also helps you protect your assets. So we heard uh, in the clip before, if you have an invention, you can file a patent over it and obtain protection for the asset. Um, another form of protection, which is the flip side of the coin to patents, are trade secrets. And we'll talk a little bit about those as well. Also, in terms of your brands, uh, if you have a brand like a BlackBerry or Windows or iPhone, um, then you can file a trademark. So IP helps you both collect your assets and also protect them. So what are the kinds of assets? We talked a little bit about this. Um, ideas, uh, inventions, also things like uh, business plans. Uh, so your business plans are um, you know, basically you know, part of your overall IP portfolio and you want to ensure that you have proper um, IP protection measures in place. For example, a very basic thing which I tell my clients is make sure that you mark all your business plans and documentation that you share regarding your product, whether it be with partners or potential recruits or investors, mark them as confidential. You know, just say confidential ABC Inc. Uh, may sound very simple, but actually that goes a long way towards establishing trade secret protection uh, for your business plan ideas. Names, brands, software, various forms of design, all these things can be protected through IP. So we talked about how IP is a legal fortress, but IP is also a sword and a shield. So let's talk about patents, which is the most uh, notable and strongest form of IP. So we know that patents protect inventions. And 
the three key tests that any invention has to meet in order to be patentable is that one, it must be new. So that means nobody else must have patented it or publicly disclosed it. It must be non-obvious in the sense that even if it is new, it can't just be an obvious improvement on what existed before. And finally, you must have commercial utility. Most cases, when you're discussing patentability of your invention, you're really talking about those two first prongs. Is it something new? Uh, and is it uh, non-obvious? A patent upon registration gives you a 20-year monopoly over that invention. So in other words, it acts as a sword because it lets you exclude other people from that particular uh, invention. Now, the one thing that I'm sure most of you are aware of, but if you're not, we have a first-to-file system in Canada and the US on patents. And so what it means is it does not matter who invented it first. So even if you invent something first, if someone else beats you to filing it at the USPTO or SIPO, you're out of luck. You have no mechanism um, for uh, obtaining patent over that. And secondly, there's no good guy defense. And what I mean by that is that under patent law, it doesn't matter if you independently come up with exactly the same invention. If I hold a patent on an invention and you're completely unaware of my patent, you've never seen any disclosures of my invention, uh, maybe it's a product, you've never seen the product, and you're just sitting in your own garage and you come up with exactly the same thing, it doesn't matter. If you show up in court and I sue you for infringing that patent, you're out of luck and I'm gonna win. So it doesn't matter, there's no good guy defense. So let's talk a little bit about patents as swords. And I'm gonna sort of talk, uh, do this throughout as I talk about different forms of IP, give you a sense of this sword and shield mechanism. So patents as swords, um, we talk about this as being sort of the offensive strategy, okay? So this is basically, I will obtain a patent uh, because I want to sue my competitors. So, for example, the I4I I case is a perfect example of that, right? And the idea there is, you're infringing on my patent, you have to stop doing it, or you have to pay me for it, okay? So, one or the other, or both. If you've been infringing for a while, there might be damages that you have to pay. Um, so, what is, how do you gain this, uh, I mean, what, is, what are you sort of, balancing out here in terms of using a patent as a sword. Well, you're looking at about at least, at least, four to $5,000 to file. And this is basically a provisional patent. So this is the simplest form of patent. And I don't want to get into uh, too much uh, detail around provisionals versus full patents. But essentially, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a way of uh, obtaining that priority filing date without having to you know, spend ten to $15,000, which is really what you would have to spend to file a full patent application. So that's what you're looking at in terms of the expenditure on filing it. Um, but you have to also think about, well, if, if really you're obtaining a patent to use it as a sword, it's only useful if you have the money to spend to go and enforce it. So if you have a patent sitting on a shelf and you're not going to enforce it, the government's not gonna enforce it for you. So if you look at the typical patent lawsuit, you're looking at upwards of a million dollars in legal fees to enforce that patent. Now, you know, if you have um, you know, venture money behind you, such as I4I I did, uh, or perhaps you can find uh, you know, there are firms that will take patent litigation matters on a contingency basis, so they will take you know, uh, a percentage of the final awards. Um, in, in the lawsuit, then you may be able to manage something. But the point I wanted to leave you with is, if you're looking at patents in a, from an offensive strategy, then you have to think about the cost up front, but you also, more importantly, have to think about the cost of enforcement. So if you don't have the money to enforce it, it's not really useful. But let's talk about the flip side. And I think this is where a lot of cases, for a lot of startups at least, this is more so what you're really looking to do when you uh, when you obtain a patent. Again, except unless if you're venture back, then you have a lot of capital to spend and enforce the patent. And that's to use patents as shields. So this is where essentially what you're doing is you're saying, one, I'm ensuring that I'm not gonna go after other people, but by obtaining this patent, I'm basically saying at least I have the right to practice this invention within the scope of my patent. 
but it's also acting as a deterrent. In other words, what you're doing is you're kind of holding a bargaining chip because if somebody comes and sues you for infringing their patent, especially if they're a competitor, what you're trying to do is you're trying to have the ability to counter sue them and say, well, I might be infringing on your patent, but guess what? You're infringing on mine. And so if you look at, for example, the Google acquisition of Motorola, that was primarily a defensive move. So Google was not buying the Motorola set of, I mean, you know, primarily they were purchasing Motorola Mobility for their IP portfolio or their patent portfolio, but they weren't doing so in order to use those patents to start suing everybody and collecting money from those lawsuits because that's not primarily the business that they're in. They were doing that really more from a defensive strategy. I put a link there, actually there's an article in the Globe and Mail with a couple of quotes from yours truly on this, but essentially what Google was seeing and what was happening, and we talked about this before, is Apple was basically, you know, going out and suing all these various companies, device manufacturers that were using the Android uh, operating system. And Google thought, well, we got to sort of build our own portfolio of patents. One, to defend ourselves if Apple comes after us, so we have something to counter sue them with. But secondly, also to have the ability to maybe license some of these patents to our partners and our device manufacturers so we can help them defend against Apple as well. So there's a lot of strategic thinking here. I want to sort of that go on a side um, um, sort of you know uh, side issue here, and that's really this issue about patents versus innovation. Um, and I think there's really two um, two groups or two perspectives on this. Now, from a pure intellectual property perspective, in other words, what's the rationale for patent protection? And that's that essentially patents help innovation. And so the argument there is, and the reason why the government grants patents is, we want to incentivize you to invent things and to come up with innovation. But if you're gonna come up with something and somebody's gonna be able to just copy it from day one, you're not gonna really reap any benefits from your investment. So we're gonna give you this patent for 20 years uh, as a monopoly over this invention so that essentially this economic incentive to be able to derive these benefits from this patent will incentivize you to innovate. So that's the, that's the core argument for patents and I think it holds true you know, in a lot of cases. But there's the other argument which is that patents actually kill innovation. And so you'll see people out there who will say, well, you know, essentially what we're doing is we've created this system and we've created almost this Cold War scenario where you have uh, tons of uh, money being spent to build up these patent portfolios by these large companies. And at the end of the day, what they're doing is they're just pointing their missiles at each other um, and you know, in some way scaring off other companies from being able to innovate uh, or each other from being able to innovate because everybody's always scared of I might be infringing on so-and-so's patent. And if you look at, in fact, the overall patent portfolio, there's probably you know, dozens or hundreds of patents, more thousands of patents that are sitting out there in the USPTO or CPO that are being infringed upon. But people may not be enforcing them because as I mentioned to you, you have to have the money to enforce the patents, right? Um, and I think what's happened with this argument is that this has kind of really come to a head right now with a lot of um, reform happening in patent legislation in the US. And also probably with what happened in terms of the software industry where there was tons of patents that were getting issued which did not necessarily meet those two prongs uh, of uh, you know, patentability. Does anybody remember the two things we talked about? About what you need, so you need to, it needs to be new and it needs to be not obvious. So I know there's tons of my clients, CTOs will tell me, you know, here's this guy who's got this patent on such and such algorithm. I studied that back in 1975 you know, when I was going computer science at, at UFT. So you have those issues as well. But, you know, I think people, there's arguments to be made for both sides, but I think the question I want to leave you with is, you know, if you think about um, $12 billion that Google spent on buying those patents uh, of Motorola, how much innovation could Google have actually produced? And when I say innovation, I mean products that they could have actually made or services that they could have brought to the table if they'd spent $12 billion on developing those things as opposed to buying those patents. 
So I think that's where the question comes. And if you look at what was happening, you know, obviously companies, you know, all, all these uh, tech companies have their big PR departments. But there's a lot of debate going on in the blogosphere when, you know, Apple went and, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they talked about patents and then the Google general counsel went out and said, well, we're only doing this as a defensive strategy. It's, you know, they're the evil guys for seeking to disrupt innovation by buying up patents and we're being forced to do this. But whichever way you go, at the end of the day, um, I think, you know, there's a question mark, I think, at a macro level uh, that can be raised as to, you know, is this really uh, fostering innovation? So anyway, that's my side uh, discussion on patents and innovation. Uh, but let's come back to, again, uh, IP as a sword and a shield. So let's talk about trademarks now. So trademarks as shields. So essentially, when you obtain a trademark over a, a brand or um, you know, a slogan or a logo, what you're doing is you're saying you're ensuring that you're free to use that brand or logo. Uh, and the one point I want to leave you with here is that uh, a lot of my clients will come to me and they'll say, okay, I've applied for ABC Inc. Uh, I've done my own you know, incorporation federally and I have ABC Inc. registered. Doesn't that mean that I have the right to use ABC Inc. as my corporate name? Um, yes and no, because corporate registration is not necessarily enough and corporate registration does not give you the same uh, rights or the same scope of right as a trademark does. Um, so that's the one point I want to leave you with there with regards to corporate registration. I think the other point here is um, you want to protect your brands and you want to look at obtaining a trademark before you invest in the brand. Um, so what I will do a lot of times with my startup clients is I'll ask them and I'll say, okay, you know, you, you come to us, you know, as with anything, there's a Cadillac service and there's a Camry service. So, okay, if you have venture money and you have $25,000, $30,000 to spend, we'll get it, you know, we'll, we'll look at your patent strategy, we'll file trademarks, we'll get everything done perfectly for you. But a lot of times startups come to us much earlier and, you know, cash is king. So what we'll tell them, particularly on the trademark side is, you know, how committed are you to this brand? I mean, is this a brand that, you know, you've, I mean, are you gonna put out marketing stuff? Are you gonna start to, um, you know, uh, really advertise this, you've registered the website, you have the domain name, and this is really an, an intimate part of your overall business strategy, then you want to invest in protecting it up front so that you avoid, you know, as I talked about, RIM's problems with the BBX and the BBM, right? I mean, even large companies can sometimes miss the, miss the boat on their, on their trademark strategy. The other thing, too, with trademarks, as opposed to patents, is that they're much more affordable. I mean, you're looking at you know, a few hundred dollars to file a trademark as opposed to a, to a patent. And it's a much shorter process. I think you heard again in the clip, you know, you're looking at three to five years from filing a patent until the patent gets registered or is issued. Uh, with a trademark in Canada, you could be between six to 12 months. So we've even seen as fast as, I think, under six months uh, in our office. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a much simpler and faster um, mechanism of protecting uh, IP. I wanted to make a point about patents, which just slipped my mind. Oh, uh, as a, so when I was talking about patents, and I think this applies to all forms of registered IP, so with trademarks and patents, you actually have no right to enforce your IP right until it's registered. So in other words, when you file for a trademark today, that doesn't mean you can go and sue somebody and because you don't have a trademark registration issued yet. That can take six to 12 months. Same thing with a patent. So you file for a patent, um, but until the patent gets issued, let's say five years later, you can't go and sue your competitors. So sometimes people uh, confuse that. People believe that because they filed something, all of a sudden they have an enforceable set of rights. Um, Okay, so let's go, let's continue. Um, let me talk again about another form of IP. Again, going back to this IP being used as a sword or a shield. So let's talk about trade secrets. Um, so trade secrets, I mean, the, it's pretty self-evident when you talk about trade secrets. You're talking about the secret sauce behind something or you're talking about any sort of confidential information. This can be, the source code, if you're a software company, it can be uh, algorithms, 
If you're a materials company, it can be your chemical formulation, it can be your business plan, which we talked about before, where I said, you know, you should make sure you put on confidentiality notice. It can be your customer list, your vendor list, your strategic relationships, pricing. Standard way that you protect trade secrets uh, contractually is through non-disclosure agreements, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And essentially what you're doing in a non-disclosure agreement is you're limiting use of that information that you're disclosing. So in other words, for example, you will say, if you're dealing with a potential customer, you're saying in your NDA, okay, I'm gonna share some information about my product, uh, but the only reason or the only use you can make of this information is to evaluate whether you wanna buy our product or not. Um, similarly, you wanna limit disclosure. I'm disclosing this information about my product to you, but you can't turn around tomorrow and sort of you know, post it on your website or talk to somebody else or share it with your partners or investors. Um, I'm gonna say, for example, that you can only share this within your company with your employees. And so how, is, how are trade secrets then used as swords? Well, essentially what you do is if they exceed those limited rights that you've provided them, you can go and sue that uh, party that you entered into the non-disclosure agreement with. So let's come to the last uh, prong. So we talked about how IP is a legal fortress. We talked about how IP is a sword and also a shield. Let's talk about maybe the thing that you care about the most, which is how do I make money from this? And let's, uh, let's start with patents. Well, so I don't know if you re heard uh, recently, but uh, uh, Microsoft has now um, uh, licensed uh, a bunch of its patents to a variety of Android mobile phone or device manufacturers. So they're essentially making some revenue by licensing their patents. And, uh, and I think a lot of these uh, device manufacturers are again looking at this from a defensive strategy. So to ensure that you know, they're protected if Apple comes knocking on their door. Um, you also will see this in hardware or, or sort of IP core licensing or hardware licensing deals where you know, uh, you'll have um, you know, either a chip-based uh, firmware that's being licensed and is protected by patents and you're obtaining some licensing and royalty revenues from that. Uh, you'll see it in materials and biotech startups. So patents can be used as a form of uh, revenue generation. Similarly with copyright, uh, copyright licensing. So if you really think about it, the software industry would not exist without copyright. I mean, the, the whole essence of software and licensing software and obtaining uh, licensing revenues is because software is protected as a form of literary work under copyright legislation. And again, uh, going back again to the iTunes uh, discussion that we had, music is another form of uh, work that's protected under copyright. And again, through licensing that copyright, you're generating revenue. Um, similarly with trademarks, uh, with brand, uh, co-branding agreements or branding agreements, or even merchandise. So if you look at the, the George Lucas uh, um, uh, Star Wars sort of empire, I mean, a large um, portion of the revenue that gets generated uh, from the Star Wars franchise is essentially through merchandise and branding and you know, little Star Wars Lego toys and you know, so on and so forth. So we've talked about um, you know, why you should care about IP. Now, so what do you do about all this stuff that I've told you? So what do you actually do, you know, when you leave this lecture? And this is a point that I, I try and make uh, every year. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's an important one. And that's why I've left it for the end, is that IP at the end of the day is just a business tool. So intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyright, trade secrets, um, they're really in the service of your business objectives. They should be viewed as being in the service of your business objectives. So they're not the goal. So I will get calls countless times from startup clients who will call me. I've invented something. Do you think I can get a patent on it? And I ask them, why do you want to get a patent on it? Why? Like, do you want to just add to your portfolio of saying, I'm the named inventor on these patents? Oh, great. What's the purpose of this? You're going to spend time, you're going to spend money. You need to know why you want to do what you want to do 
around the IP, and it's got to be in the service of your business objectives. It's only a means to an end. So until you know what your business model is and what your business strategy is and where you're headed, in my opinion, there's not much use in spending a lot of time you know, trying to figure out you know, different forms of IP. Now, you, the kind of questions that you want to ask yourself as you're going through this analysis is, you know, is this, how do I make money from this? Is, it, is this important? Is this piece of asset that I have important? And how, do, how does this help me maintain competitive advantage? Right? So those are two key questions that you can ask as you're thinking about how you want to use uh, IP. Okay. Um, so I will tell you how I um, look at IP when I come to a company as an investor. So if I'm looking to put in some money as an angel investor, um, this is how I look at it. Now, I'm probably a little bit more familiar with these issues than your typical angel investor, being a lawyer as well. Um, but I think it holds true with a lot of uh, sophisticated angels who really have a good understanding of IP. And so the first thing is they will look at the company and they'll say, okay, are there any patents in this company? But I think for those who are a little bit more sophisticated, they'll say, okay, so you know, maybe they've spent some money filing these patents. Um, maybe it's, you know, they need to spend another fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on this. Okay, so what's a purpose? Why, did they, why, did, why are they filing this? Let me understand how this fits with the bigger business plan behind this company, right? So if you look at a company like I4I, their patents were pretty critical to their technology and at the core of their technology. And if somebody was coming on board to invest in the company when they were you know, on the brink of enforcing their patents, it was pretty clear that that was a central part of the company's strategy going forward. So you want to really look at it, and I study how does it fit with the business strategy. A lot of times, particularly in digital media, I will also look very closely at the trademarks of that company. So, okay, so you have this logo and you've built a lot of brand awareness behind this. Uh, have you trademarked this? Are there other confusing logos out there? Could there be other companies that could come out from the woodworks, you know, like six months after I've put in my money, claiming that you don't actually have the right to use this logo uh, because you're infringing on their trademark rights? So I want to make sure that if you're building a brand that you have the right to continue building that brand. I don't know if you guys were uh, aware of, I mean, there's been, again, a few high-profile cases, but uh, the iPhone, when the iPhone was entering the Canadian market, there's a company called Comwave. Has anybody heard of Comwave? Yeah, so, you, so you guys were aware of that, of the case, right? Because Comwave had a service. I think they're a VoIP provider. They had a service, and they had branded it as iPhone. So Apple basically had to come in and make a deal with them in order to enter the Canadian market. Uh, so trademarks matter as well. In terms of copyright, if it's a content play, you know, whether it's user-generated content or third-party content, I'm going to look very carefully. Do you have proper agreements in place uh, to ensure that you have the rights to uh, the copyright in, in this content? Definitely for software. I'm going to make sure that you know, this is original software that's written by that company, that they have employment agreements in place, consulting agreements in place. Uh, if they're using third-party open source software, that that doesn't cause any issues with uh, copyright in their, in their code. And with patents, sometimes I care, sometimes I won't care. It really depends on the kind of company that it is. A lot of times, consumer-driven, uh, you know, user-generated content plays, you know, it's, it's, a lot of it is going to be about you know, brand awareness, you know, uh, uh, speed to market, you know, how viral is this, what's the community, as opposed to patents. There's going to be other cases where the technology and the innovation is so critical to success that I'm going to care about it particularly if it's inventive technology, right? So when I look at something where it has an element of an inventive technology, then I'm going to care about, about patents, as well as trade secrets. So how carefully have they managed to protect the, um, you know, their secret sauce you know, prior to filing a patent? So how do I, if I were to uh, give you a strategy for how you approach um, thinking about you know, IP as part of your business strategy, and I would do this before I go and seek, you know, even speak to a lawyer. You know, how do you prepare for this, right? So don't pick up the phone and call someone and say, I want to get a patent. Right? Think about why do I want to do this. So first of all, list your core business assets, okay? It's very simple. Take a piece of paper, list your core business assets, and focusing on your intangible assets, right? So inventions, 
uh, code that you might have, employees, um, you know, and, and then prioritize those assets, right? So think about, you know, which one of these assets is going to be more critical to my success going forward? So, uh, you know, how critical is my logo going to be? How critical is this particular innovative technology going to be? How critical is my source code? How critical are my, um, you know, business processes? And then based on that, once you've done this prioritization, that's when I would go and seek advice. And I'd seek advice from someone who understands IP, but also understands startups. And so the way we work with our clients is we will sit down and we'll develop a strategic IP plan for them. So what we'll do is we'll do something that's customized for them, that helps them prioritize where they should spend their time based on how they've prioritized their assets. And we'll develop a timeline and a budget uh, as to how we would approach it. Um, so again, the point here is, you know, think about your overall business strategy before you, you know, jump into IP. And that's it. Thank you very much. So we're going to handle questions. Yeah, we, I think we have a question at the mic on the left side. Hi. Um, uh, I don't deny the utility of intellectual property, um, but could you talk? Okay, about that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you, could you I have to go look for another job. A little mm. bit more about uh, how like patents and intellectual property could be used against you. So, like the whole regressive process of it being caught up in litigation, right? And the whole business of uh, U.S. Congress like trying to amend the policy so that for, for copyright infringement. C can you talk a little bit more about uh, also uh, like process oriented patents? Okay, so uh, let me answer your first question. Um, so I think uh, um, what, what you're really asking about is this whole issue of what we call, you know, freedom to operate, let's mm -hmm. say, right? So which is, I mean, from a patent perspective, right? Which is, you know, if you're if you have a product, um, let's say you've come up with some piece of technology, um, you know, you, unless you do a patent search, you can never be assured that you're not infringing on some third party's rights, right? So somebody may always come out of the woodwork and seek to enforce their rights against you. Yes? I think that, um, like I wouldn't deny that uh, IP stifles innovation at all, I think, if anything. <clears throat> like, the idea of being able to apply registered intellectual property to which it uh, is relevant to the particular context. Because, I mean, there are a lot of filed applications that might be very minutely Right. Different. Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure of what your question is. So, I mean... Uh, I'm just uh, interested in knowing how would you go about, after doing your research and seeing what's out there, filing a patent and uh, bringing a product to industry, even though there's a lot of products that might be similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the, the whole patent filing uh, process is something that you would work with with your patent agent. So they would look at you know, what the patent landscape is. Uh, they'll look at what the prior art is and then compare that to what you've come up with and see if there's any elements that are new and non-obvious, mm -hmm. you know, compared to what's already existing in the patent landscape. So it's a very fact-specific, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's going to be driven very specifically about, you know, based on the technology that you have and what exists prior to that. Mm -hmm. But they will help you tailor that. But, you know, again, with a view to, you know, what is your ultimate strategy that you're trying to get out of this process. Thanks. Uh, hello, my yeah. name is Himi Syed, and are you familiar with Andrew Carr? Uh, he invented mm -hmm. a financial instrument called a cash management account, which connected your brokerage account mm -hmm. to your credit card, and it was a way to bypass the Glass-Steagall Act, which um, you could do cross-state, interstate banking. Now mm -hmm. you can do it, but at that time you couldn't. Mm -hmm. So he basically got screwed by Merrill Lynch by creating the instrument. Right. And they got the money. You know, he sues. He's trying to get his money. 
They give him $100,000. He's screaming some more. They give him some more money because he doesn't have the money to fight a right. big financial institution. Yeah. So long story short, I had a similar experience with a Canadian bank about 20 years ago, and they took my financial instrument. I don't have the funds to fight what I began the legal process of protecting, and I've kept my mouth shut and some of my ideas. Uh, to return to your slide where you asked the question, if Google didn't spend the $12 billion on just buying patents from Motorola, how much product development and what did we lose? So can, how best can one protect a financial instrument? It essentially comes back to a contract. Okay, so that's a good question. So, so, <clears throat> so it's gonna depend on exactly what, you know, uh, it's, again, it's somewhat fact specific, but typically in the kind of scenario, the kind of technology that you're describing, you're either gonna go by the way of patents or you're gonna go by the way of trade secrets. So uh, trade secrets only work to the extent that um, it is uh, difficult or virtually impossible to reverse engineer the core elements of the technology or the product that you've come up with. So in other words, if, uh, if I can just take whatever device you've made and I can pull out the chips and pull out the code and reverse engineer it and learn the process or methodology that you've used, trade secrets are not gonna be the best way of protecting that. Um, and there, you really need to go the way of patents. You can also mix these up, so there might be portions of it which you keep as a trade secret and portions of it which you patent, and that's again gonna be based specifically on, on your situation, right? So, but at the end of the day, I think with all these forms of IP, uh, you need to be willing to, to enforce them, right? And uh, particularly with patents, I know it's, it's very, very expensive. And so, you know, one of the things I try and tell people is, I mean, if you're really thinking about patents as an offensive kind of strategy, you have to keep that in mind. Um, having said that, you know, again, there are firms that will work on a contingency basis to enforce rights in a patent. I mean, they have to obviously do their due diligence and you know, they, they're gonna do it if they believe that you have a, a shot at it, right? So. All right, thanks. Okay. Hi, I'm yes. uh, wondering if you could spend a moment or two talking about jurisdiction shopping. Mm -hmm. uh, I've already been involved in one venture where they said don't even bother registering your trademark or patent in Canada, do it in the US and the EU, especially if you're working in tech because nobody's looking at the registrations in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also told that there are certain things related to say business processes that aren't even patentable say in Europe whereas they are patentable in the US. Uh, could you just spend a little bit uh, yeah, expanding sure. on that? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, so, so I think Again, um, going back to the core underlying theme of my presentation, it's again, what is your business, right? So jurisdiction shopping, but what is your business, right? Like what's your market? So I, that's gonna drive it first and foremost, right? So for example, if you're gonna set up a website that's an e-commerce website in Canada selling products to Canadians, you're not gonna go and file a trademark in the US, right? So that's the first point, right? So it's gotta be driven by your business. Um, but having said that, let's assume you have an international market, you're gonna sell everywhere, uh, you're gonna have users everywhere, customers everywhere, then you're gonna do a very strategic analysis of the various jurisdictions, right? Uh, and so for example, with a lot of our clients, you know, if they're doing, if they're looking to file a patent, you know, in most cases, the vast majority of them, their biggest market is the US. Uh, and so what we'll do is we will, you know, get them to file one in the U.S. first, and then we'll, and this is very standard practice in, in Canada, even most Canadian patent agents, or a lot of them who are, are, are also qualified in the U.S. will follow that strategy, just to file in the U.S. first and then piggyback in Canada, right? But I think, um, you know, a lot of this, again, is going to be driven by what is the nature of your business, where are you going to sell, and what jurisdictions do you care about? Because ultimately, you know, IP is jurisdictional, right? So, and that's a good point, right? Is, you know, if you file a trademark in Canada, that means you can enforce it in Canada, right? Then you gotta think about other markets that you wanna, that you want to enter. Okay. Yes. Yeah, my, actually my question was along the same line as the gentleman just asked. Uh, like, where would you file first? And you answered it, like you'd file, the, the dominant market is US, so 
most patents or it seems to be being filed in the U.S. first. So I'm wondering if you could talk maybe a little bit about, for example, if it was a green tech mm -hmm. industry, for example, would you go and file first in, say, places like Germany first as opposed to... That's a very good question, very good question. So, for, But again, it comes, it comes back down to... A, um, so, the, okay, there's two aspects to that. Uh, I think one is, again, let's assume that you have an international market for your product. So you're not going to file in the U.S. if you don't have a U.S. market, right? Like if your market is solely in Canada, primarily in Canada, and you don't foresee expanding into the U.S., you're never going to file in the U.S. So you never file in a jurisdiction where you don't think you're going to do business. But having said that, there's a whole strategy, and you know, a patent agent is better versed at this than I am. But as to where do you file first, how do you sort of piggyback on these various filings? And so, for example, there might be two reasons why you would file in Germany first. One might be that, uh, you know, that's one of your primary markets. So let's say if you're, if you're operating in the solar industry, right? So you look at Europe, you look at Spain and Germany, which have, you know, hugely, you know, subsidized programs in that particular space, and you envision that that's going to be a primary market for you, then you might rejig your patent strategy to go, you know, to those European jurisdictions first and then the U.S., right? So... There's a lot of things that are going to be fact specific, so you can't, but it's going to ultimately be driven again by your business, I think. Yes. Hi. So, Hi. Um, <clears throat> so I'm getting a bit of uh, conflicting information, but also kind of the same at the same time. So it seems like my, uh, I mean, just to me, it seems like it's much easier. I mean, patents aren't easy to begin with, to patent something that's physical, physically engineered, say, like, you know, a new medical. Mm -hmm. device, you know, like, for example, swallowable, um, you know, colonoscopes kind of thing, which was made mm -hmm. and patented, stuff like that. So that you can patent, that's why, you know, and so bioscience kind of thing, you can patent that kind of stuff. But when it comes to software, like something like a Facebook or even, uh, you know, anything that's, or any software that's being made now on the back of Facebook and Twitter where you can see pull in something from them or even with mm -hmm. um, APIs, it's harder to patent because there's a, there's a host of developers who all use the same tools to make whatever it is they make online. So everyone's, if you're a, a Python coder and you make something in Python, then it's, mm -hmm. it shows to reason another person who really knows Python can just make the exact same thing you make because you can understand even look at your code. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're .NET or whatever it might be. So I find that, you know, our patent lawyers have come to us and said, well, you should just copyright the logo. I'm like, who cares about copyrighting the logo? They're not going to copy the logo. They're gonna, people are going to want to copy the idea or how it works or the right. algorithm we've written. And even algorithms cannot, my understanding, cannot really be patented and enforceable as much as it might cost. So you can get a provisional patent for four to 5000 or 20000 to actually get it filed, which takes 10 years, like you said. But is it really worth doing? Because at this point, investors are looking at your IP and they're saying, okay, well, we know that we cannot, um, you, yeah, you copyrighted it, which is great and all. We know you can't patent what you're doing, so investors are now more interested in getting you money quicker to beat the competition before they catch up with you. So, mm -hmm. wh wh so what would be the real use of going to an IP lawyer for uh, a digital media kind of person or someone in tech in that kind of sense versus someone who's made something, you know, that's like a physical cool invention? Mm -hmm. So... Um Again, so I think your question is more about, you know, as a software or digital media company, well, the same what, you, you, what it, you know, there's no point in IP for me. I mean, maybe. I mean, that's maybe generally what you're saying. So, um, and, and again, your point was, was more specifically geared towards patents, as I, as I understood. Um, so let me, let me try and address it. Uh, so first of all, there's different forms of IP, right? So... You know, there's just copyright, there's trademarks, there's patents, and there's trade secrets, right? So, uh, as a digital media startup, so let's say, for example, your code has some secret sauce or algorithm behind it, right? Um, so you may not, maybe you can't even patent it. Maybe it's not innovative enough to patent it, right? You're still going to need advice on the copyright. And maybe you need some advice on how do you maintain it as a trade secret. So if you look at, like, a company like Google, a lot of their proprietary search stuff is still a secret sauce. They're not filing patents on it, right? Um, but, but there's a lot of mechanisms and IP and trade secret policies that go along with maintaining that a secret. So that's one thing. The second point is, uh, no, it's, it's not that you can't patent software, okay? So you can patent software. Um, but yes, traditionally, the laws have been more geared towards you know, machines and hardware and physical stuff. 
I mean, that's, I mean, you look at the, you know, Amazon one-click patent, which is now actually going through a federal court system here in Canada. So, and they sent it back to the examiner, and they reaffirmed that you don't have uh, a per se exclusion of business method patents in Canada. So you can get a patent on it. So that's the other point. Uh, but the question is, does it make sense for your particular kind of digital media startup? I don't know what, what business you're in, right? But it may make sense or it may not make sense, right? Well, my understanding is that, just to kind of go one more thing, is that it's, it seems to be, as far as digital media or, any, or even any kind of software creation, that you can patent interfaces, which is why Apple you know, can sue uh, Android and so forth. You can patent stuff like that, but as far as the underlying stuff, so for example, you cannot patent the idea, so someone with the same background in coding or different can just say, okay, nice interface, we'll make another interface which we like better that does the same damn thing. Yes. So. Yeah. So your interface will, I mean, so you can't patent the interface, yes. You can't. That is true. But, but Apple has patents on the swiping. So, you know, <laughs> it's always, you know, how, you know, so part of this is going to depend specifically on what, I mean, when you talk about interface, you're just talking about the UI. Yeah, I mean, just the pure UI, you can't patent that. Yes. But there could be elements of it. There could be elements of the interaction, right, that could be patentable, which might give you a leg up. And part of the analysis is going to be about, you know, when you look at your company, I mean, somebody might look at your company. You might have a, a talk with an IP lawyer, and they might look at it and they say, okay, I understand your product. You know, really there's, I mean, everything that can be, um, everything that's unique about your product can be understood just from the interface and working with it. There's nothing special underlying it. There's nothing special that I can see anywhere. Okay, maybe there's really nothing that can be patented here, right? But maybe there can be. So, you know, uh, and, and then again, if it can be, how useful or how central is that to your business strategy, right? That's the second part of it, right? So I, I think it's, I guess my point is, um, I'm very wary of making broad generalizations, but in general, in digital media, yeah, most of my digital media companies don't get patents. So, I mean, most of them don't, but there's a few who do. So it's really gonna be, you know, case dependent. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if you don't get a patent, it's gonna be about your execution, how good is your product, speed to market, boom barrel. Somebody can look at it and say, hey, that's a great idea, I'm gonna do it better, right? Um, but it doesn't always happen that way either because, you know, they figure that, you know, I mean, if that was the case, there would be no startup business because Google and Facebook and these guys would be looking at all these digital media companies and saying, great idea, I'll do it myself. Great idea, I'll do it myself. I think, you know, that it doesn't really work that way either, right? There's, there's some other things that are at work there other than just having a patent to protect yourself, right? There's other ways of gaining competitive advantage, I guess. I so, hope that answered part of your question. Um, I'm just realizing that we've reached 7 o'clock and we've got uh, quite the demand for questions. Maybe we'll take one more um, while the event is live and then take the rest offline if Arsh will be kind enough to uh, stay for some questions. Sure. Go ahead, yes. Thank you. First, I wanted to thank you for the presentation. It was excellent. It was a thank refreshing you. perspective. You don't hear that side very often. Thank you. Um, yeah. I run an entirely web-based startup. And I want to hear your comments on the argument that in that space, it's really your brand and your domain name, in fact, which is your, your patent or trademark, simply because in the two to five years it would take to get granted something which is defensible, your website, because it's fairly fast to develop, it's lived and died and grow to a point where it's re reached a critical mass, which is defensible. Uh, at that time, when you were to be granted a patent on that, if someone were to come and claim that they had prior art, you would be able to show the utility aspect, the fact that at the time that it was created, it was new, novel, um, and it, it did have that aspect of utility because it reached a certain size. My case in point, let's say Facebook today. You know, Five years ago, maybe they did or maybe they didn't file patents mm -hmm. and trademarks against that. Obviously got to a certain size where someone wasn't gonna copy cat and, and pull the rug out from under them. So in the web development space, do you really need to spend your time developing trademark and patents or should that should that money maybe be better spent on brand and development? Um, so I didn't understand the point around trademarks. So why are you saying you shouldn't spend money on the trademark? If, if you have a, a domain name yes. in, in the web space, isn't a domain name almost equivalent to a trademark? No, it isn't. Uh, no. So, so actually, you know, and, and you can, yeah, domain is, is not equivalent to a trademark. Uh, and you could have issues with uh, somebody who owns a trademark trying to prevent you you know, once you've started building up the company from using that domain name. So that's a f the first point. Um, 
But, uh, you know, even, I just want to clarify something, even on the patents, so again, I'm not saying that if you're a web-based startup, just forget, like, you know, forget patents because it's all about speed to market, right? Um, so, you know, you might, again, you might be a web-based startup, but you have certain piece of technology that's so inventive that's part of your uh, competitive advantage from day one, right? And, and, you know, in launching, you might be disclosing that to the world, so you may want to file a patent before you even launch, right? So even as a web-based startup. And that could be even not even an inventive piece of technology. It could be even a business. I mean, look at, again, the, you know, Amazon one-click ordering method. I mean, that's not like, you know, rocket science, right? It's a, it's a business process. Um, so your web-based uh, startup could have something akin to that, which, again, you know, if you launch and everybody's going to see it, then they can copy it and you're out of luck, right? Uh, so you may still want to potentially pursue it patent for it, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in general, you're, you're right. In general. It's, it's going to be more about execution. And to clarify the question a little bit, let's say Facebook doesn't have any, any trademark or patent at all in, in filing or in registration whatsoever. Does someone like that have to be worried about a copycat organization hunting them down and, and filing something in five years later? Oh, no. Okay. So I see what you're saying. So, uh, so it's... Um, Yes and no. So, so on, on the trademark side in particular, on the branding side, it's not only about filing, it's also about use. So you could, um, if, you know, let's say, you know, I look at, let's say Facebook has no trademark today in Canada, okay? And, and I say, okay, you know, I'm going to start up something and I'm going to, you know, try and trademark uh, Facebook in Canada, right? Um, so they would have a very legitimate claim, and I don't want to get into the details of the legal proceedings they could use, but there's a variety of proceedings they could use to stop me from either obtaining that trademark or enforcing that trademark against them because they can say, we've been using it for six years before he applied or obtained the registration. So you have some but, um, but you could have someone who's been using that mark and also has filed for registration now you could be out of luck, right? Now, you, now you're starting to really sh potentially endanger. I mean, you know, and again, look at the RIM sin scenario with BBX or BBM. So it's, it's not a, um, so use matters, uh, but, you know, filing, getting registration matters as well. So you don't want to say sort of, you know, oh, I won't register or I won't file because, you know, I'm using this stuff, right? Um, so. Okay. okay. For, for everybody else that has questions, I just wanted to highlight some resources that we have at Mars to help you with IP, because it is a really complicated subject. Um, every six months, we have a, a workshop on how to draft a patent for people who are looking for real hands-on how you actually draft a patent. Uh, we also, if you're a client of Mars, have free legal services with various different law firms that we partner with so that you can work on your, um, or ask questions specific to the IP questions that you have for your company. There's also an IP strategy workbook online that will take you through questions of thinking about what you have for IP to identify it. And there are other articles um, in the IP section, the Entrepreneur's Toolkit. We do also have two uh, lecture videos, best practices, one on IP for ITC or ICT companies, so it's looking at specifically software, and another one on IP for life sciences companies. So there's lots of resources. It, it is a very hard topic for us to tackle in an hour, but I really appreciate Arsha um, giving, it, giving it a shot. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.